Hi, this is Remembering the Past, a show where we talk about people who've died recently who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. We're going to start out with our feature tonight, Orson Bean, who died recently at the age of 91. He was hit by a car crossing the street in Venice, California. And normally I don't give the cause of death, but I can pretty much guarantee that Orson Bean, having lived as long as he did and with the sense of humor he had, would have found some humor in that situation. He was one of my favorites, a brilliantly witty and talented guy. And besides that, he was true counterculture. Not any of this nonsense you read about these other people. He was a lefty in the 1950s and got hit by the blacklist. Then in the 2000s, he became a conservative. His daughter married Andrew Breitbart, a conservative in Hollywood in 2020. That's counterculture. And he could articulate his political positions as well as anybody. Not this drugstore socialism or right-wing nonsense that people spout off every day. He was born Dallas Frederick Burroughs in Burlington, Vermont. He was a second cousin to President Calvin Coolidge. He joked that when he was six months old, he peed on Coolidge. His father, who became the chief of police for Harvard University, was a co-founder of the ACLU, so you know he grew up in a lefty background. He started out after the war as a stand-up comedian. He was really good at it, very funny, and he worked in all the left-wing places, the Hungry Eye and the Purple Onion and the coffee houses in Greenwich Village. He changed his name to Orson Bean after Orson Welles because it was funny and he knew comedy. Here late in life, he does a little joke class. Joke telling is an art. The joke should be short and always told in the present tense. An example. An old guy says to his friend, I heard you took a memory course. He says, I got a memory like a steel trap now. He says, where could I take such a course? He says, the best thing that ever happened to me. He says, where could I take such a course? He says, I took it from a doctor. He says, what's the name of the doctor? He says, what do you call that uh, flower? It's red. It's got a long stem with thorns. He says, rose. He says, rose. What's the name of the doctor? <laughs> He's Irish, good Yiddish accent for an Irish guy. Yeah, that got him on Ed Sullivan a bunch of times, but he got knocked off because sponsors don't like his left-wing views. He went to a communist meeting a couple of times trying to pick up a comely communist girl. So to survive the blacklist, he went to the theater, and he was quite successful. He was in the play Will Success Spoil Rock Hunter with Jane Mansfield, and he used to tell about how he'd go to her dressing room when she would call him all the time to talk. So he said, ah, I saw Jane Mansfield naked a bunch of times. He got a Tony nomination for the play Subways are for Sleeping. We talked about that when we did the Phyllis Newman podcast because she won the Tony that year. By 1960, the effects of the blacklist were wearing off, and he did a great role in a superb movie. He was a psychiatrist in Anatomy of Murder with Jimmy Stewart and George C. Scott. That role barely got mentioned in any of his obits, and it was among his best work. Rod Serling used him on an early Twilight Zone. It wasn't a great episode, but he was a great character, playing a character just like himself. What are you looking for, Mr. Beavis? My car, my Rickenbacker. Correction. You don't drive a Rickenbacker. That's your car. That little thing? Well, gee, do you think it fits? Beavis. Live it up, will you? But have you ever driven a 1924 Rickenbacker? Then he had what I consider his signature role as one of the panelists on To Tell the Truth, where he was incredibly funny, and he would draw pictures and talk about the dreaded Gaboon Viper, so named because it would bite you on the Gaboon. Here he is questioning the panelists, one of whom wrote a cookbook for dogs. Oh, Orson Bean. Number two, do you find there are many dogs with enough money to buy your book, or where's the market for such a book? Primarily for the people who have medium and small sized apartment dogs. And lots of free time. And go looking up a uh, roast leg of spring cat and things like that. <laughs> do dogs, number one, you know about the eating habits of dogs. Why do dogs chase cats? And if a dog, if, I've never heard of a dog catching a cat. Cats are smarter than dogs and they get away. Would a dog eat a cat if he caught him? Or? In the late 60s, he dropped out for a while, went to Australia, got into self actualization and LSD, and then he came back. He was a regular on Johnny Carson for a while. Very very funny on that. Johnny had to take him off because Orson got too weird. He had a little alcohol problem. Got into television, was on Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, Modern Family, was in the films being John Malkovich. And late in life, he became a conservative, as I said, Andrew Breitbart's father-in-law. He was outspoken, but very articulate. He was also a founding member of the Sons of the Desert, the Laurel and Hardy Appreciation Society. Guys like Orson Bean don't come along very often. Well, we're going to move on now to Robert Conrad, who died recently at the age of 84. Nice German Chicago boy from the South Side. He went to South Shore, Hyde Park High. 
And he spent two weeks at Nutria, but most people don't know that. In his late teens, he delivered milk, and he delivered milk to a restaurant on West Oakland Street in Skokie run by Harry and Rose Wilson, Sid's de facto aunt and uncle. And Harry and Rose took Robert Conrad in, almost adopted him, and he didn't forget about it when he was a big star. He would come back to Sparky's all the time and tell stories about Hollywood. Now that Robert Conrad's gone, there's nobody left, so this is the only memorialization. He said he studied at Northwestern for a while, but I don't know how he got into Northwestern because he didn't have a high school degree. Supposedly he studied theater there. Anyway, he hooked up with Nick Adams, might have been while visiting James Dean's grave in Indiana after he died. He moved out to Hollywood, and he got involved with the first of the three iconic roles he played in television. As we've talked about before, ABC was the upstart network, and they liked detective shows. Of course, their class was 77 Sunset Strip, and he played Detective Tom Lopaka for a little while in 77 Sunset Strip, and then it became a crossover for the series he starred in, Hawaiian Eye, with Connie Stevens. And we talked about Connie Stevens just a couple of weeks back when we did Kooky, the Ed Burns podcast. Hawaiian Eye was basically 77 Sunset Strip in Hawaii. Here's the intro to Hawaiian Eye. <laughs> Starring Anthony Isley, Robert Conrad, and Connie Stevens. Also starring Grant Williams with Nancy Fonz. Hawaiian Eye. That just screams early 60s ABC. Anyway, Robert Conner was very good looking. He was athletic. He used to be a boxer. And when the James Bond craze hit around 1963, 64, 65, CBS said we have to have a James Bond-like character. And they put him in the post-Civil War West, and that was the Wild Wild West, which was Robert Conrad's most famous role. That was a really underrated show. His partner was Ross Martin, who did all sorts of disguises and most of the good acting. And they had great villains on it. It was sort of a pre-Batman type thing, where they had Michael Dunn as Miguelita Loveless, and Victor Buono as Count Mazeppa. They had beautiful girls on all the time. And occasionally you'd spot someone like Richard Keel or Richard Pryor. And a great TV scene, and a great opening where they would do drawings with scenes from the show. This was really a well-put-together show. Here's the promo for the pilot episode, which had Suzanne Plachette, Victor Buono, and Naomi Persa. It's a strong cast for a television show. New this fall on your favorite channel, Western Adventure with the Excitement of Espionage, The Wild Wild West, starring Robert Conrad as undercover man James West. His assignment, top secret, dangerous. <laughs> He and Ross Martin became big stars from that show, and deservedly so. Poked around in a couple other television shows for a while, and then he had his third starring role as Black Sheep Squadron leader Major Pappy Boynton. He was sort of dragging this typecast after that. I have to mention two other things about Robert Conrad, the Columbo connection. He was a great villain, probably better than Ross Martin, who was a better actor. Robert Conrad was Milo Janus, a health chain operator and physical fitness freak with nothing but contempt for Columbo. This is like the perfect role for Robert Conrad. Columbo trips him up at the end on some splice tape and some shoelaces. Catch it if you can. It's a great episode. And they play the Milo Janus theme song at the end, the only time that ever happened in Columbo. Ross Martin, the art critic, and another Columbo is good, but he's not that good. And finally, one of the funniest moments I ever saw on television. Robert Conrad was the captain of the NBC team in the Battle of the Network Stars in 1976. He felt they got jobbed in a relay race, so to decide the competition, he decided to challenge Gabe Kaplan, the neppy Jewish guy on ABC, 
to a race. He figured he would kick his ass. What he didn't know was Gabe Kaplan ran track in school, so Robert Conrad started out in the lead, was real cocky, and all of a sudden Gabe Kaplan passes him and beats him going away, and Robert Conrad is all bent out of shape. Quite funny. Check it out on YouTube sometime. I think he ultimately developed a sense of humor about himself, but his career ended after a nasty car crash. Well, we're going to close tonight with Roger Conrad, who died recently at the age of 92. Roger Kahn was the author of one of the greatest baseball books ever written, The Boys of Summer, which he wrote in 1972, and it was a chronicle of the Brooklyn Dodgers of the early 50s and then following them up 20 years later. It is a superb book. In fact, Bill Veck, a very, very smart guy and a pretty good writer on his own, said that Roger Kahn will have to live down The Boys of Summer for the rest of his life because he'll never write anything that good again. And indeed, that was true. He wrote a bunch of other books, none as good. And in fact, he wrote a book about Pete Rose and defended him, saying he didn't bet on baseball. And a couple years later, Pete Rose came out and said, yes, he did bet on baseball. Roger Kahn's reputation took sort of a hit for that. But be that as it may, we still have the boys of summer. Roger Kahn was a nice Jewish boy from, guess where? Brooklyn, Erasmus Hall High School. Here is a sports writer, Joe Posnanski, writing in The Atlantic about Roger Kahn. Roger Kahn was a longtime writer and author, not only of baseball. Through the years, he wrote eloquently about the poet Robert Frost, the violin virtuoso Yasha Heifetz, the politician Eugene McCarthy, and the writer John Lardner. He wrote about his son Roger Jr.'s struggle with heroin addiction and death by suicide. He wrote about being Jewish in America, and he wrote about the Roaring Twenties when Jack Dempsey reigned, and he wrote a not very good novel version of his own troubled second marriage. Mostly, he wrote The Boys of Summer. It was simply unlike any other sports book that had ever been written, and I would argue unlike any sports book written since. The core idea came from his own unlikely and sudden rise from the rabid Brooklyn Dodgers fan to the Brooklyn Dodgers beat writer just as the team gelled into something magical and cursed. He was 24 years old when he was assigned to cover the Dodgers for the New York Herald, and that team was inarguably wonderful. Jackie, Pee Wee, Preacher, Shotgun Shuba, Campy, and the Duke. That team won pennants in 52 and 53. That team also lost the World Series both times to the inevitable New York Yankees. In the first half of the book, Con writes about his own journey. At a point in my life, he begins when one is through with boyhood, but has not yet discovered how to be a man. It was my fortune to travel with the most marvelously appealing of teams. In the second half of the book, Con went back to find them, those boys of summer, now 20 years older, and trying to make their way in life. When he first tried to sell the boys of summer, Con found no buyers. Who would want to buy a book about an old baseball team that wasn't even good enough to win? And Con tried to explain to them that it was the fact that those Dodgers did not win that made them so captivating. Their skills, Roger wrote, lifted every man's existence, a national team with a country in thrall, irresistible and unable to beat the Yankees. But beyond that, I've always believed that the book wasn't about the Dodgers or winning or losing or any of that. Well, it was about those things, but it was about more. In between the journey and the return, he wrote the most beautiful and haunting part. He wrote about burying his father, Gordon Kahn. More than anything, this was a book about fathers and sons and the space in between. Outside, the summer sun was taunting. He wrote of that moment after he chose his father's coffin, I walked to the car, a lawyer at each elbow, wholly alone. The wrongness of things seized me. At the parade grounds, boys were throwing footballs. It was that season. Baseball would come again. The team was broken up, and with my father dead, there was no one with whom I wanted to consider that tragedy. And because there was no one, I recognized that the breaking of a team was not like greater tragedy. Incompleteness, unspoken words, unmade music, withheld love, the failure ever to sum up or say goodbye. No question, that guy was a writer. Is The Boys of Summer the best baseball book? Well, I'll give you a couple of other nominees. Fall 4 by Jim Bouton, whose podcast we've done. The aforementioned Bill Veck, writing Veck as in Wreck. One book that doesn't get very much mentioned, but it's a superb book, My Life is Fan by Wilfred Shee, whose podcast we've done. And two books by the other Roger, Roger Angel, the writer for The New Yorker, who wrote The Summer Game the same year as The Boys of Summer and five seasons. You won't go wrong with any of those. Well, I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Tepps. As a final tribute to Roger Kahn, you might think we do The Boys of Summer by the Eagles. Nope, too predictable and not the right song because it's about California, not Brooklyn. So we're going to go to who else but the chairman of the board 
and his great song, There Used to Be a Ballpark, which was about Ebbets Field when the boys of summer played there. And uh, there used to be a ballpark where the field was warm and green and uh, the people played their crazy game with a joy I'd never seen. Yes, there used to be a ballpark right here 